Nation. Hello, that's Lauren Miley. And that's Taylor Shreve. Welcome back to an amazing episode we have today. Welcome. So today we have on Associate Professor Dr. Rochelle Powers. She received her doctorate degree in criminal justice from the University at Albany in 2012. Dr. Powers has previously served in the Governor of Maryland's Office of Crime Control and Prevention, where she worked on a variety of issues, including the death penalty, racial profiling, and trends in violent crime. Her main research interests lie in the areas of violent victimization, public perceptions of crime, and domestic violence. She has conducted research on the causes and consequences of self-protective behaviors, longitudinal trends in domestic violence, cross-national comparisons of victimization risk, and the moderating effects of gender on the risk of injury and violent encounters. Dr. Powers recently wrote a book with her colleagues and some of our graduate students as well. Yes, the book was titled Addressing Violence Against Women on College Campuses. And today we'll be discussing the book as well as some, other her, some of her other research. So welcome, Dr. Powers. Thank you so much for being a part of our podcast. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> so we know that approximately one in five or one in four women will be the victim of sexual violence during their college years. And isn't it correct that there's a higher relevance of sexual assault on campuses during certain time periods? Yes, absolutely. So uh, one in five or one in four, and the numbers vary, um, but they all indicate that this is a big problem of uh, women that will experience sexual violence on college campuses. And a woman is at risk at any time during the college career, but the first six weeks, actually, of the fall semester is particularly uh, dangerous. It is actually known as the red zone. Um, and this is particularly uh, dangerous for women who are freshmen as they come in and they start to acclimate to the college experience. There's more autonomy. There's unsupervised uh, peer interactions. Um, and in addition, we have the culture of uh, uh, binge drinking and risky behaviors on campuses that contributes to this problem. So does the red zone affect all college students, including men? Uh, it does, but it's really focused uh, mainly on freshmen who are acclimating to the college climate. Um, the estimates for male victims of a sexual assault are, are less than women. In a 2007 campus sexual assault study found that about 6 point, about six percent of men will experience uh, sexual assault, either completed or attempted. Uh, during their college years. Um, however, we know that sexual assault is, is vastly underreported for both men and women. Okay, so do you guys want to talk about what happened at UConn? Yeah, I know we just watched a video that I think we really liked and we'll post it for our listeners, but do you guys want to talk about it? Yes, I do. Okay, Obviously, let's get into that's, it. That's why I brought it up. <laughs> so I think we talked earlier on our other podcast about mm -hmm. this particular um, documentary. So this documentary was called It Happened Here. And something interesting, too, is that USF is actually playing UConn in our homecoming game Ooh, this year. coming yeah. up this year. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so just throwing that out there. So, uh, yeah. So that's the, the homecoming football game. So we watched this documentary, and one of the things that shocked me the most, this student, she was an undergraduate, and she wrote an open letter to the school's president, which was in The Feminist Wire. And basically what she was trying to say was that the Husky, which was their mascot, was kind of one part of this culture that was really like promoting aggression. Mm -hmm. And people took this very, very negatively, and now the Yukon mascot is kind of like a symbol of rape almost mm -hmm. because of these terrible memes that people started putting out after this letter. And in the in the documentary, I remember the girl saying she was like, yeah, I what happened? I never thought that this would have happened. Mm -hmm. And when I was watching it, I was like, yeah, I mean, people are terrible. <laughs> I, I could probably imagine whatever it is. But then she started talking about what happened. And I was like, I, no, and I could have memes were never imagined terrible. this. Terrible. They were. So they had the Yukon mascot, and it said, I heard I heard you like rape, mm -hmm. was one of them. And another one was, like her, rape her. And all of this just came out because of the change in the mascot. So the mascot was like a friendlier kind of version, and then it would became like a very aggressive husky. Mm -hmm. So it was just... It was just so terrible that that happened after her letter. Yeah. 
and it was directed just, at her too. Yeah, that's kind of was the, the, what was the point that I was going to make was that it was just kind of she did an open letter just to defend yeah. herself and address the president of the university and almost the entire university kind of lashed out against her. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really it was just was a um, a mascot. I didn't really think that it was that maybe that bad that they made this aggressive turn and then once I saw the memes I realized actually how aggressive and how serious this problem was just by having this mascot Mm -hmm. so yeah it will be interesting to see it at our homecoming game kind of just knowing in the back of our minds that that I don't know that that mascot has done such harm to people on their campus yeah yeah so I think you know there's been a number of uh, documentaries print media uh, magazine articles and open letters that that speak to this issue and I think it, uh, you know, it speaks to a larger cultural problem on campuses where we think that this behavior is okay. Mm-hmm. So we just talked about, you know, one in five or one in four, whatever the statistic that you want to, you know, we think that one in five or one in four women uh, have been the victim of sexual assault, and that's referring to sexual assault. But there's a, a larger problem with regard to attitudes and behaviors along these lines. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Exactly. So we have to think about sexual violence as a continuum, mm-hmm. right? Um, where it kind of, it ranges from uh, problematic uh, words and attitudes and then ranges all the way to sexual battery, mm-hmm. right? Um, and of course, there's less sexual battery and, and more behaviors on the lower end of the spectrum, but those comments support sexual assault, mm-hmm. right? Make it more normative. So this is a, a, indicative of a cultural problem on mm-hmm. campuses that condones violence against women. But the good news about these open letters and these documentaries and these news stories is that it's bringing uh, to light to the problem and, and mobilizing students to change that culture. And that's mm-hmm. the that's mm-hmm. the positive message from all of the terrible things that we keep seeing. Yes. Yeah, that is a really absolutely. Good point yeah. And I think that that was all that she was trying to make in that letter was she was just saying that this culture, this whole culture, like, needs to change and needs to be a little more positive. And then mm-hmm. the backlash from that was just unbelievable. But a positive point. Thank you. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need that positivity. Okay, so this might be kind of an odd question, but should or can a survivor of sexual assault on college campuses, can they go directly to the police? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, students have a lot of options and um, where they can go um, after they've been victimized. Um, and those options should be determined by the services that they need um, or they want. So student victims, just like victims of all sexual assault, may need a lot of things, right? They may need a sexual assault forensic exam. They may need help navigating the criminal justice system. They may need immediate um, and or long-term counseling. But student victims in particular have unique needs. Right, so they may need uh, academic accommodations, right? Changes to their class schedule to avoid the offender, uh, get right. excused absences, make up work, help navigating their professors in that in that manner. They may need housing accommodations, right? They mm-hmm. may need to be changed to avoid the offender. Mm-hmm. They may need help making sure that they're not in the same dining hall, the same shared spaces. Mm-hmm. So student victims have unique needs. So students can certainly start that process by going to the police, Mm -hmm. and the police will take a report, investigate, and start the criminal justice process of that. And then they're going to refer students to services on and off campus. But sometimes students don't want to go to the police, right? Uh, Campuses also have confidential reporting sites where students can go, get the help they need uh, without involving the criminal justice system or or even student rights and responsibilities, right? So uh, many universities have confidential reporting sites and offices uh, that would allow them to get those services without going to the police. I didn't actually know that. I think that's something really interesting that I think a lot of people maybe aren't aware of on their own college campuses that they probably think they either have the choice of police or just going to the office of administration. But it is good to know that some universities have kind of an alternative that's not so maybe daunting after something like that. Absolutely. Yeah, there's many reasons why victims maybe don't want to report to law enforcement, um, but that doesn't mean that they don't need services. Mm Mm-hmm. I know there are a lot of issues with reporting sexual assault in general, and especially on college campuses. Dr. Powers, what do you think are the most pressing concerns with this problem? Well, number one is knowing where to go for what? Mm -hmm. Awareness, right? We just Mm -hmm. talked about the fact that, you know, you guys might not know where all the confidential reporting sites or your Mm -hmm. services you can utilize or who you report to. Um, And certainly a campus of 40,000 or 50,000 students, it's awareness is a huge issue. 
Uh, you know, we have training for our undergrad students at orientation. Mm -hmm. Everybody does. Uh, this is federally mandated. Uh, but we need reminders, right? At mm -hmm. orientation, students are dealing with so many things, trying to find their student ID, who they're going to hang out with that weekend, mm -hmm. um, where their classes are, their class schedule, where whirlwind. anything is. Yeah. And then throwing in, oh, and by the way, if you're a victim, go here. Mm -hmm. That message can be lost. So we need reminders. Mm -hmm. oh, so awareness is a big one. Um, students should know their rights, right? Uh, so Know Your Nine is mm -hmm. a great web resource for this. Uh, but students should be educated about the process and their rights. Um, and we need to, again, continue to change the culture, right? Mm -hmm. We need to eliminate the stigma of being a sexual assault victim, um, ensuring that they aren't re-victimized by mm -hmm. the system. And we have legislation that puts into place those procedures, right, like Title IX and Campus Save. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to make sure that we continue pushing forward with that and being in compliance. Um, and we need to educate police and other officials on trauma-informed care mm -hmm. and trauma-informed investigations, right? We often think, for example, that uh, memory is like a tape recorder, right? This was an analogy that Gary Wells used in he studies uh, eyewitness uh, testimony or eyewitness identification. And so it's not, right? Mm -hmm. A memory is not like a tape recorder, um, especially when someone's victimized, mm -hmm. right? So recollections may be emotionally traumatic, uh, nonlinear, right? Um, they, and, and they might not remember certain key details at first, but then they remember them later. And all of this sounds like maybe they're making it up, but really understanding what memory is like mm -hmm. um, for people who have been traumatized is, is key to protecting students um, while adequately investigating these cases. Mm -hmm. And doing that well will eventually create a culture where students feel supported and able to turn to these reporting sites. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's a cultural thing. I mean, I remember when I was a Greek, uh, I was in a Greek organization here and they made us go to like a sexual assault training. And it was even just the culture of people making jokes while they're showing the video and things like that. So I don't even know if I remember what was taught because people were making so many comments just about the fact that we even had to be there. So I do think that it is an overall cultural issue versus just whether or not they showed us the video because they're federally mandated to. So I do think that's the bigger issue as well. And so discussing um, what options students have, there's a couple of kind of discussions taking place I guess between um, who should be responsible so the schools or law enforcement so kind of how we've discussed does a student go to the police do they go to the university mm -hmm. so there's kind of like an ongoing conversation now of who's responsible though or kind of responsible for helping the student what are kind of your takes on that discussion? <laughs> yeah, you know, this is certainly a discussion we've been having for years. Um, it is a lot of responsibility on the part of a university to take care of that many students, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they have always been responsible for protecting the safety of students. Uh, now, in the last couple years, I would say really starting earnestly in uh, 2011 with a Dear Colleague letter, we've seen clarifications to those expectations, mm -hmm. right? Um, and some transparency, right? So the Clery Act, for example, uh, makes sure that uh, people know um, mm -hmm. the status of, of campus crime, right? Um, so, and Title IX clarified that sexual violence is a gender discrimination issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and mandated prevention, campus aid mandated prevention on college campuses, right? Just to name a couple of different sure. avenues mm -hmm. that we've uh, clarified our expectations of safety on campus. So, Solely relying on the outside criminal justice system does victims a disservice, right? Um, because they have unique needs above and beyond uh, what you know sexual assault mm -hmm. victims may be in the community need. And we talked about those unique needs before. And so it really takes a campus response in order to address those unique needs related to housing, accommodations, uh, curriculum, et cetera. So with relying on the criminal justice system, um, those needs are only met if they report that assault, right? And we know that sexual assault is, is vastly underreported, right? Less than half in almost right. all studies of sexual assault are, are reported. So although we are certainly scrutinizing campuses lately for their mishandling of sexual assault cases, they're necessary, right? We need to change how they handle it and keep them accountable. Because, you know, historically, law enforcement has been criticized for exactly the same, for mm -hmm. re-victimizing victims. Right. Mm -hmm. So what about third-party investigators? I know some of those documentaries that we've been watching kind of touched on this idea of, like, having an outside party uh, come in and help with these types of investigations. So what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so there's a lot of different models that campuses use to investigate and handle these cases. And certainly some campuses are moving to third party investigators. And, and the logic is quite simple and, and, and it makes sense that an outsider can provide an unbiased investigation and recommendation mm -hmm. compared to campuses who all campuses have the best interests of students in mind and there's often competing interests with regard mm -hmm. to protecting reputation and protecting both sides, right? So, you know, you got to keep in mind we're not only protecting the people who are the complainants or the victims, but we're also protecting the respondents, right, and making sure that they, they have a, a, pro right. a due process like situation, right? Mm -hmm. So third party investigators can help with that. It needs, they need to make sure that they're adequately trained on the okay. dynamics of sexual assault, particularly the dynamics of sexual assault that happen on college campuses. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot more of sexual assaults that involve people who know each other that may involve alcohol or drugs, um, and a lot, obviously, very rare that you're going to have a forcible rape situation. Mm -hmm. And those, the situation, the dynamics of sexual assault on college campuses is, makes it very hard to investigate these cases. So it's, it's certainly a well-intentioned idea. Um, it just needs to be implemented properly. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, definitely. Because I know, so with having it on college campuses, it seems like a lot of the issue, too, is that that particular college, they want to protect their reputation, right? So mm -hmm. if you are looking up the statistics of a certain college and you see that they have so many more rapes than or sexual assaults than mm -hmm. some other college, then you might be more likely to go to that other college. Well, so even it's when we were so hard. The case of to, Jean Cleary and how her yeah. parents chose to not let her go to New Orleans because they just had a recent assault. Yeah. So they took her to somewhere else with a. So you could definitely see where mm -hmm. universities want to kind of limit the amount of things like that that are happening, which does cause this mm -hmm. bias. So. Absolutely, yeah. Universities want the best interest for all their students, mm -hmm. um, sure. and they Absolutely. certainly want a safe environment for everybody. But, you know, as we know from reading these stories or watching these documentaries, one bad case looks awful for mm -hmm. a university. Mm -hmm. Now, an interesting note with the statistics that you brought up, so parents often look at uh, statistics of sexual assault um, to determine how safe a campus is, mm -hmm. which is very interesting because we've seen, obviously, an increase in uh, sexual assaults on all campuses. And this isn't necessarily an increase in the occurrence, but an increase in the reporting, reporting. Mm -hmm. which so, is what we want. Right? Yeah, we exactly. want them to be reporting. Absolutely. So we should see that an increase in reporting is actually a good thing on campus mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. this means that the campus is taking meaningful steps to make a safe environment that supports victims. Mm -hmm. I right. often say um, that if you see that zero sexual assaults occurred, you should be very scared. Like, because mm -hmm. that does not mean that it's a safe campus. That just means it's not safe for victims to report. It's, it's kind of like the reverse. Like, it's not like you want to see high numbers of sexual yeah. assault or, you know, things like that taking place at a campus. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you'd almost rather see those numbers because then you're aware that they're doing the right thing versus mm -hmm. seeing low numbers and thinking it's a safe place. Absolutely. Right. But that's kind of, I'm sure that's hard to explain to parents who are trying to pick a university and they see those high numbers it's I'm yeah sure it's hard to explain to them especially you're trying to navigate know. where to send their child yeah. yeah but that is a good point to make definitely so what would you recommend to improve university response so policies and legislation I think is working uh, when it's implemented correctly so I think the legislation and the policies and the procedures uh, that universities are implementing whether they're mandated or not are working uh, when they're implemented correctly the big problem right now that campuses are facing is that they uh, oftentimes focus on compliance with these federal mandates, and then they lose focus of the spirit of those mm -hmm. mandates. Mm -hmm. And this can cause us to uh, check boxes on a checkbox list mm -hmm. uh, to say that we've done it and not meaningfully create lasting change on campuses. So mm -hmm. the most important thing college campuses can do right now is to, to address things in the spirit of it, not just the literal words of it. Mm. So a theme that has emerged here at Crimeversation is asking our experts to bust some myths. So especially with something like sexual assault and on college campuses, what? I'm sure there's plenty. So are there any myths that you would like to bust? Absolutely. So we have a lot of myths that surround what a rape victim looks like mm -hmm. um, and what a rape entails, mm -hmm. right? And the first thing that we see, which I think speaks very uh, well to um, when we were talking about before with the Yukon uh, situation and other documentaries, is that women lie about this all the time, mm -hmm. right? We think that women are just making false allegations of sexual assault, and that's mm -hmm. simply not true. 
Uh, it is a an ordeal, and it can be a traumatic experience for a woman to report. People aren't just jumping the gun and doing that. Now, it certainly happens, but it actually happens at the same rate of false reports of other crimes. Um, this isn't an epidemic of women lying about this situation. The FBI says that these are comparable to someone a false reporting armed robbery um, mm -hmm. or arson, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the same for all crimes. And it's not something when someone says, oh my gosh, someone burglarized my house, you're not thinking, well, they're probably lying. So when you do take into account that it's very comparable levels of false reporting, it seems kind of silly when you think of it like that. So we do know that women are really not false reporting and that is a great myth to bust absolutely yeah. absolutely and and going to that we often think uh that women are responsible somehow for that victimization by mm -hmm. what they were wearing oh, what they were the drinking yeah. right this is so that somehow they brought it on themselves mm -hmm. um, but we certainly don't ask that of other victims sure. right so mm -hmm. a victim of armed robber we don't ask him if he was wearing a rolex watch mm -hmm. or if he was walking towards his nice car mm -hmm. um and so we don't put that level of blame on other victims mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I think yeah. just when you compare the way that we respond to sexual assault to other crimes, it just sounds, I mean, we know it's silly because we, you know what I mean, we study it and you're an expert in the field, but it does just sound so silly. Like, yeah. were you wearing a Rolex? You know, how was your hair done? You know, did yeah. you look expensive or wealthy today? Yeah. It does just sound so silly. But we re-victimize women by asking those questions. So, mm -hmm. any other myths? Absolutely. So, we, uh, we often have this stereotype of what these uh, dynamics of a sexual assault entail and we touched on this a little bit actually a couple minutes ago where we think it's uh, a stranger um, mm -hmm. who's predatory and jumps out of mm -hmm. the bushes or a van and a forcibly attacks a mm -hmm. woman uh, but we know that that's simply not true and it's not true on college campuses and it's not true in the general community uh, most often a woman is victimized by someone that she knows mm -hmm. And a lot of times on college campuses, this involves the influence of drugs and alcohol, um, mm -hmm. either ingested willingly or unwillingly by one or both parties, mm -hmm. right? So, so just understanding what the dynamics of these actually look like is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I remember hearing somewhere about this whole stranger danger thing oh, and yeah. how that and repeating that over and over to these children has actually been the danger, right? Because it's not mm -hmm. the stranger who's going to be doing these things most likely. It could you know? be the cute boy in your sight class, and the next thing you know, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And we used to, and we, we don't necessarily do it now as much, but uh, a couple decades ago, sexual assault prevention education on college campuses looked really different. We got all the women in one room, and we taught them how not to get raped. And it was very much focused on this stranger danger model. And, you know, we talk to women um, all the time and ask them, you know, how many of you put your keys in your knuckles when you're walking oh, yeah. through the parking garage, right? As your mm -hmm. mom, like, tells you when you first go to college, Absolutely. like, do you have your mace? Mm -hmm. You know, are you holding your keys the right way? Right, exactly. Just don't tell us that. Yeah. You put mm -hmm. a pair of flats in your purse, not necessarily to mm -hmm. prevent blisters, but so you can run away. So you put your flats on so you make mm -hmm. sure that you have shoes mm -hmm. where you can get away from situations. Uh, you keep your mace on you. You don't mm -hmm. smile at people um, who are, like, walking you know near you you cross the street if you see a mm -hmm. guy and all of those I'm not saying it's bad advice but they address a very very rare occurrence compared mm -hmm. to the vast majority of sexual assaults mm -hmm. right especially we have I mean just here on USF we have so much new housing taking place we have so many freshmen that are here mm. I mean there's just I mean even just driving around we have crazy traffic I'm not sure where our listeners are and what their universities are like but I mean just here on campus there are so many kids and they're walking everywhere so I think it's just really hard to imagine all of this. It, that is, you know, how the red zone works. They're just, they're not fully aware of how high the risks are, I guess. It's a I don't brand know. new yeah. situation. Yeah. yeah. So Dr. Powers, this could be a really um, impactful podcast for some people. They could know someone, they could be victims themselves, or they just want to be really great advocates and allies. Do you have anything you would tell people? Kind of just a lasting impression. If they did listen to this podcast, what would you kind of say to them? I guess I would say, uh, you know, to anyone who may be a victim, um, that there are, uh, at least on campus, there are plenty of services and places that they can go to um, for this trauma. And it might mm -hmm. not be trauma that w happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, it could be, you know, trauma that happened historically, but we still have campus resources to support our students, whether yeah. that's uh, officially reporting or seeking counseling, um, we, we have those services available. For allies and people who might be disclosed to, uh, believe, believe your friends, believe your family members that this happened. Mm -hmm. That's um, a good point. And, exactly, and point them to those kinds of services that mm -hmm. can that can help. So, in our last podcast, Taylor and I were actually talking about 
um, a myth that we were busting that we sure. didn't even know prior to our own research. And that's the fact that if something were to happen off campus, that we still have all of these different things available to us and these resources available to us. Can you kind of touch on that a little bit? Absolutely, and you're absolutely correct. Uh, so campuses offer services to students, um, whether they're victimized on or off campus, and whether they're victimized uh, very recently as a student, or whether they're victimized uh, you know, prior to being a student. Services are available to students, and it's part of the idea of student success, right? Student success means that we mm -hmm. help you and remove those barriers to being able to, to mm -hmm. be a successful student, right? Mm -hmm. um, so these services are absolutely available to all students. I just had my TA training on campus and they were talking to us about student success and how that's like a new movement on campus of how they're trying to kind of make sure that the student's overall experience, I'm sure you can explain a lot better than I could, but now there's features on Canvas or whatever students you use in other universities. You can help refer a student to services without having to, you know, get too in the weeds. Of, I don't know, you could probably explain it better than I could, but I was really impressed that there's this whole concept now of like the overall student success versus just getting them through what they experienced mm. but their overall experience on campus i just thought that was really good this whole student success concept that they kind of introduced yeah. to us at ta training i think we're increasingly recognizing um, that students have a a lot of needs and a lot of barriers that may prevent them from being academically successful mm -hmm. um, and so we can't just address those by adjusting their course schedule we have to address the underlying issues and mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to do so um, and whether that has to do with mental health and counseling um, or whether that has to do with navigating other systems like the criminal justice system and mm -hmm. all of those have to work together to make sure that we provide, uh, that we're really doing a service. Well, in talking about responsibility, so we reference mandatory reporting and just kind of responsibility. So, so for some of our listeners who maybe aren't as familiar with that, do you want to kind of tell our listeners what a mandatory reporter is and kind of what their role is for students? Absolutely. So uh, there's a lot of people on campus that are called responsible employees or mandatory reporters. And these are people that if they are aware of an incident of gender-based violence that they have to report it to the university. And what this does is a couple things. It A, makes sure that the incident is addressed by the university because then the university has the requirement to actually investigate and handle that incident. But it also allows the university to identify patterns, right? So mm -hmm. one of the um, biggest uh, criminological facts that we have is that crime is committed by a small number of people, but they do it over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. This is Wolfgang um, for your, your criminologist. <laughs> And, you know, sexual assault is no different. Mm -hmm. And so a student that reports a sexual assault to uh, their English professor and a different student who reports it to their poli-sci professor, and sometimes these can be the same offenders, and so mm -hmm. it's recognizing that we can address those patterns and get those victim services. There are a lot of people who are mandatory reporters on campuses, and these involve professors, TAs, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of staff. And, uh, and it's also, but there are also a lot of confidential sites or a couple of confidential sites. Mm -hmm. So, and that's important to know for, for students that there's some people that they report to and they do have to report it to Title IX office. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some people they can report to where it goes nowhere else. Um, and now that's not to suggest that victims shouldn't disclose to professors. So when this idea of mandatory reporting kind of became clarified, there was a, a backlash of um, um, people who thought, you know, oh, this takes away the agency of victims who may want to disclose to the professors who they have a lot of contact with and may trust. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly a concern. And I, I certainly had that concern when, you know, we were starting all of this stuff, right? However, it's, an, it's important to note that, uh, you know, a student can disclose to a professor and it gets referred to the Title IX office and the student doesn't have to participate in the process. And that's where their agency really comes okay. in, where a student doesn't have to then go through the interview process and everything, right? So students okay. still have that agency. So I don't want the, to dissuade any students from reporting to people that they feel comfortable with. And at the same time, students should recognize that there, there are obligations um, by their professors and then their TAs to report um, these, these victimizations. Most syllabi now actually have a, a disclaimer on there mm -hmm. that they're a mandatory reporter. Um, and and any time that a, a professor or someone thinks that a disclosure might happen, it would be a good idea to you know to stop, take a step back, and remind the student um, and direct them to other places if that that is not a process that they want to start. That's what I was going to kind of ask. If I feel like most professors, if let's say someone sat down and they realized it was head, I mean, unless it was a very quick outcry, they would 
most likely remind the student that just to let you know I'm not sure if you want this to proceed I just want to let you know I am a mandatory reporter so then the victim at that time could kind of make the decision I feel like most faculty maybe it's a generalization most faculty would maybe remind the student that they are a mandatory reporter just to kind Mm -hmm. of protect that relationship that they may have. Or Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, to respect the student um, and their agency and their ability to make decisions, you know, especially in college campuses where students are adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and, and so to protect the student while um, also protecting uh, the processes of the university with regard to reporting, that, mm-hmm. is, that is something that happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, this has been very fun. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Powers. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for busting some myths, especially in the wake of the red zone right now on college campuses. So thank you so much. Yeah, that's very important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye, guys.